okay so the now the next talk is on total insecurity of communication via strong converse for quantum privacy amplification by robert selzman which is joint work with nilanjana datta both from university of cambridge robert please go ahead yes yeah thank you for the possibility for letting me speak here um yeah the title was what she said if you want to have more information about this work it's on archive and yeah let me now start um so let me quickly remind everyone about like how you would communicate a classic message if you have a secure key everyone knows this but still uh, to introduce some notation basically so if Alice and Bob they want to communicate this message or Alice wants to communicate a message to Bob a classical one um okay but there's Eve in the middle sitting there um tries to understand what the message is so if Alice now has a key um, she can encrypt the message to this uh, MK, right? Bob also has the key. Um, hope you can kind of see all of the slides that the Zoom window is not blocking. Maybe I put in more here. Um, so if Bob also has the key, he can decode the message from the encrypted message MK. But um, if Eve has no knowledge of the key K, um, then both the key and the encrypted message is fully random to her and she has no means to, to understand the message, right? So, okay, we are interested in how you could uh, distribute those keys. So classically, um, I mean, we do this all the time, basically right now, but um, this distribution solely relies on computation hardness. Um, in the quantum world, that's not the case. So if you allow some quantum communication before like this communication step, uh, like the, the communication of the message, and um, Eve has maybe also access to this quantum channel Alice and Bob are using. Um, but if she, if she like does a measurement on 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 the on the quantum message sent, um, she will disturb it, and Alice and Bob have means to find out that someone was was there. So because of that, uh, yeah, quantum principle, no information without disturbance, we can actually prove information theoretic uh, security uh, results. And okay, the main method for that is obviously quantum key distribution. So I'm focusing on like just the last step of a, of a quantum key distribution protocol, which usually is quantum privacy simplification, right? So here, Alice and Bob already share um, some key and it's perfectly correlated, okay? So it's like um, in some alphabet from one to N, it's distributed over some probability distribution P1 to Pn, but um, there's some side information Eve has. So she has some quantum state, this row eyes, okay. And she, in principle, she can just measure her quantum state and then has some means to guess what the key actually is. So for her to be not able to do that, what Alice and Bob want, they want to just decouple from each side information. And usually they want to apply a hash function. Um, so kind of a classical deterministic channel um, to reduce to a smaller alphabet. So like M smaller than N, and in the ideal world, they want that, okay, the distribution probabilities for all of those new keys is now uniform. And the side information, Eve holds, is key independent, right? And in that case, okay, um, Eve has like no means to, to get the key apart from just random guessing, right? So like, therefore, the, the key is kind of secret to her if the alphabet is large enough. Okay, let's, let's put this a bit more in mathematical terms, okay? Um, kind of at that point of the quantum key distribution protocol can be described by the CQ state where X is held by Alice and also Bob, but I kind of avoid having two classical systems because Alice and Bob at that point share the same system. It's like perfectly correlated and they also do the same things, right? So I just have one X, but Eve has like this quantum side information rule um, E, which depends on X. So, okay, the hash function, it's just this F and it results to a new CQ state on some smaller alphabet Z, um, which I denote by this here. And okay, here kind of in Eve's register, you know, uh, average over all state corresponding to, uh, like where you average over all X corresponding to the certain set, that relation here. And you need to be careful, okay, this here now is a subnormalized state. So if you would normalize it, you would get like some probability distribution in Z and that would kind of lead to a CQ state in, in, in that form, right? So what we want or what Alice and Bob want is they want to minimize the decoupling error. So we measure that decoupling error and trace distance is just the 
distance to the perfectly decoupled state, right? So like on the slide I showed you earlier, that's exactly the situation on the right-hand side with uniform distribution, oops, where is my pointer here? Uniform distribution over the classical alphabet and um, yeah, key independent side information of um, Eve. And okay, why is that useful? Well, if you look at the optimal probability with which Eve can guess a key, then this is uh, upper bounded by the unif uh, like random guessing, which is exactly uh, what she would do if she if like the situation was really just um, the decoupled state plus the decoupling error, right? So if you make alphabet big and decoupling error small, um, she has like very very small guessing probability, and therefore the key is fairly secure. That's roughly the idea. So let's talk. Let us first talk about like the achievability bit of primary simplification, right? So if we denote the optimal key length, which kind of is like the largest um, alphabet Z, such that um, we can, well, I'm I'm looking at the at the log of that. That's the largest alphabet Z, such that we can distill keys um, with a decoupling error bounded by this epsilon. Oops, it's uh, should be. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, strictly bigger than zero and strictly smaller than one. Sorry about that. Um, then we don't note this this largest log uh, cardinality of Z by L epsilon X E. Okay. And if we're in a situation where if uh, sorry Alice and Bob can prepare these states rho X E, um, and then they prepare kind of many of those so n IID copies, uh, we are interested possibly in like uh, calculating the optimal key rate, which is just this key length of the big IID state and then divided by n. And we want to understand what happens in the asymptotic limit n to infinity. So there's this famous result, which goes back to Renato Renner's thesis, which tells you, okay, this thing actually has an existing limit independent of epsilon from zero and one here. Okay. Um, and it's just given by the condition of von Neumann entropy. And okay, condition of von Neumann entropy is, as you all know, given by the difference of these von Neumann entropies or by the relative entropy in that um, order. Um, so this is very nice. This is a nice achievability result. Um, we are more interested in the kind of greedy bit. So we think of Alice and Bob like that. Ah, maybe we can distill keys even at a, at a, at a higher rate. Um, if we sacrifice that we get some decoupling error but maybe maybe we are fine with that right we now want to understand how much decoupling error what really happens to decoupling error in the in the greedy regime okay so this means if you try to distill keys in an alphabet set and which also scales exponentially but now r is strictly bigger than the condition of von Neumann entropy right so okay the answer is the decoupling error blows up exponentially fast um so the strong converse uh, property holds right so you kind of uh, would sacrifice like a lot of decoupling error for getting keys at a higher rate. Um, and formally, this is summarized like in our theorem here, um, which tells you, okay, like the best possible decoupling error you can make is still asymptotically lower bounded. So this is what I mean with like this, this curly uh, inequality sign by like one minus something which exponentially decays to zero, where the exponent is given by something which really much reminds you of what George has had uh, multiple times um, yeah, in his slides. So like this optimization quantity involving now the pets uh, condition for Neumann entropy also non-optimized. Um, so here you have like some way to, to write the thing down. And okay, you need to know like this note that this theorem now works for all R. So there's not really a constraint, but um, Kind of, it's only interesting if R is large enough, right? So, like, if you do your standard lovely Rennie entropy tricks, you see, okay, the SCR is strictly positive if and only if R is actually be above um, the condition of von Neumann entropy, right? So, and otherwise, the result doesn't give you like anything interesting. Um, so, let us summarize kind of what we what we know from the earlier work and and the strong converse regime. Also, maybe quickly, I should I should mention because like uh, in that area, I think there was like a lot of work in this year. Um, kind of basically at the same time as our result, there was a result which also uh, looks very similar at like the average case here, the worst case. Um, and very recently, like maybe months ago, um, Kili and Yongsheng Yao uh, proved uh, like uh, equality uh, for the exponent 
So like kind of here, we only have an achievability, achievability results, so kind of like a lower bound on a strong converse exponent. They have equality, but in purified distance. And it's uh, interestingly involves the sandwich uh, conditional entropy, uh, but in the, in, in the, in the range uh, buff, uh, sorry, below alpha one, which kind of hasn't been seen in an operational setting before. So yeah, lots of, lots of progress in that area really. I just quickly wanted to mention that. So, okay, what's the situation? Um, summarize. So if you plot the decoupling error over the key rate, there's this critical point, so to speak, which is the conditional for Neumann entropy. Who below, if you try to distill keys below that conditional for Neumann entropy, the coupling error nicely decays to zero, right? So this is where we are. And kind of, uh, you can see from there that, I mean, okay, directly you can see by just the formula I showed you earlier that the guessing probability for E for the key decays to zero. Um, and basically, this gives you that the communication using those keys is secure. Um, our result goes more in the strong converse region. So we are like here, um, above the conditional Kahneman entropy. So we have this discontinuity. The decoupling error goes to one, as you can see here, exponentially fast, even as you, as I just showed you on the, in the theorem. Um, however, it's not really clear what this actually means, right? So, I mean, it's clear uh, in terms of, okay, if you want to discriminate your secure state from the decoupled state, okay, and the decoupled state has certain meaning, but it's more kind of, I would think of like a small decoupling error as a sufficient criterion for security of communication, but whether it's necessary condition, it's, it's at least for me, it wasn't really, really clear. So like whether, you might still be able to communicate in some form um, using keys generated from um, a secure state, which has blowing up decoupling error, right? And actually, this is not the case. And uh, I want to establish that now. And let me like try to formulate some some like framework where this this question maybe makes a bit more like is a bit more meaningful. So yeah. So this is. The, the total insecurity bit in this strong converse region I now want to talk about. Um, we, we do it slightly more general. So we have like general CQ states, uh, rho Z and E and like that. But I mean, you can always just think of the resulting state of a privacy amplification protocol doesn't really matter. And yeah, we want to understand what does it actually mean for communicating with keys generated by the CQ state if the um, decoupling or blows up, right? Goes to one as n goes to infinity. Um, okay, what's the setup? Alice generates the keys, right, from her secure state. She wants to encode a message. We say uh, we want M to be taken uniformly out of, uh, like, uniformly at random, but out of a subset MN, um, out of the, like, full alphabet. So you have some subalphabet. Alice just wants to communicate messages within that subalphabet and um, picks a uniform, uniformly at random. Uh, one of those messages, and then um, yeah, uses the key generated from the from the secure state to communicate it to both. Um, well, the encoded messages are, will denote by this m subscript key um, sent publicly, maybe to this notation. So you want that this is like uh, bijective in in the key, right? That such that Bob has, if he has the key as well, means to decode it from like the message decode the message from the encrypted message. And we also want it to be um, bijective in M. And because the message was sent publicly over like this, this channel I showed you, the classic channel I showed you at the very first slide, Eve actually has access to this full secure state. So I call these things in the following you know, message states, right? So it depends on the message sent M. And then you have like a classical register where you average over all uh, the keys. And then you have uh, in the register like the, uh, the encrypted message. And um, yeah, Eve has her original side information still hanging around. What Eve wants to do in order to infer the message is to distinguish the states, right? And what's her optimal probability? Well, it's just this guessing probability where she averages um, over, sorry, where she, yeah, where she maximizes over all possible measurements, all possible PVMs, trying to infer, given that the state uh, was through M, that the message was also M, right? So that's like the standard thing. Um, that's the optimal probability with which you can guess the message, but 
uh, in order for her to be able to pick actually that POVM, right, to achieve the optimal guessing probability, she needs to um, actually have some additional side information, right? And that's exactly knowledge of the um, subset MN, right? So she needs to know over which sub alphabet Alice and Bob are trying to communicate. And if she knows that, um, and she has also knowledge about this ensemble, which she has, then she can pick this PVM, right? Um, and what we want to now do is try to quantify that additional side information. So essentially the size of MN um, such that Eve is then able to infer Alice meshes with certainty. And okay, we say um, if the set MN is small, then uh, the additional side information is large. It makes a lot of sense, right? Because like if she, uh, if the set of meshes is very restricted, Eve has already knows quite a bit which message it actually is in the end, right? So we want to quantify how big of an MN Alice and Bob can pick such that Eve is then still able to um, infer the message with certainty. That's kind of the setup. Okay. So before talking about the strong converse bit, I've tried to like phrase this whole thing more in the achievability region. So what happens in the case one where um, uniform and the decoupling error is actually bounded by some delta strictly below one. Okay. And then kind of by very standard techniques, uh, like just trace distance bounds, you see like that the guessing probability is bounded by this delta plus a uniform guessing bound um, uh, over, over the set of messages. So in particular, this gives you, okay, if like the set of messages blows up as n goes to infinity, which is kind of usually what we would consider, right? Um, then the guessing probability is actually uniformly bounded um, by some delta strictly below one, right? So in that case, if has no, it's not a possibility to get, guess the message with certainty or formulated differently, if she wants to guess the message with certainty, she needs to have very strong uh, side information, meaning that MN is finite uniform in N, right? Um, and maybe a remark to like the, to the private simplification bit. So if you think about um, these rules at N being um, the resulting state of a privacy simplification protocol, then the decoupling error, like at least in the achievability region, um, goes to zero, right? So this delta will uh, go to zero um, or can be made arbitrarily small for n large. Um, therefore, this thing the case. So if we want p guess to go to one as n goes to infinity, if actually needs to know the message beforehand, right? So mn, the cardinality of nm needs to be one. So for her to be able to infer the message, she needs to know the message beforehand. And this kind of means that the communication is secure, right? So she needs to know everything to know the message. Um, I don't want to talk about the proof of the thing. I think many people can already guess how you would do that. That's not too interesting. The more interesting bit is kind of really the, 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 the strong converse region result where the decoupling error blows up, right? So we want to quantify a bit how the um, um, decoupling error blows up. So we introduce a speed of convergence CN, which goes to zero. And then we say, okay, we assume that this coupling error is lower bounded by one minus the um, oops the speed of convergence, and then the result, which we call like this total insecurity result, really tells you okay. In this case, for almost all sequences of messages M N um, out of the um, full alphabet, which satisfies some cardinality bound, so they can blow up. C N goes to zero, right? So the inverse of C N obviously goes to to infinity. But like for almost all set, uh, sets of messages where the catalytic blows not up too quick, so it's like strictly uh, below like this um, blow up, let's say, then the guessing probability in the asymptotic limit of Eve goes to one. So like for almost all of these still big sets, Eve can guess the message with certainty. So you can distinguish all the message states. And relating back to the strong converse region of privacy simplification, C and decays exponentially eventually exponentially fast to zero. Um, so this means that Eve can infer the message, although it's picked out of an exponentially large set. So she has kind of little extra side information, um, still large uncertainty about the message itself, just given that she knows uh, the, the subset of messages, but given her side information and that we are in a regime where the, the, the decoupling error blows up, um, she can infer the message by looking at her, like, at, yeah, at the encrypted message as well as the, as the side information. So 
I think it's kind of interesting to show a little bit the technical point how you would prove that also to like just see what the result means and um, yeah to to not hide it just under under these terms. So I would like to try to phrase the proof a bit. So the starting point is obviously like this lower bond um, here, which is like the some some suite of convergence bound. And then we just use that and the uh, operation interpretation of the of the trace distance, right, which is essentially this here, to pick a orthogonal projection, right, um, pi n, with which we kind of in a symmetric fashion can discriminate the real CQ state and the couple state fairly well, right. So this here tells you that both the type one error, so this here you can maybe think of like one minus the type one error, so the type one error would be smaller than CN as well as the type two error um, will be smaller, uh, will also be smaller than CN for discriminating rho Z and EN and the decoupled state. Okay, so we pick this POV, uh, sorry, this orthogonal projection. And what we now want is to construct two things, right? First, we not want to construct sets of messages which are large, and then a uh, POVM labeled over the messages within that subset such that we then can distinguish the message sets, right? And the starting point for creating this POVM is obviously this pi n. We kind of want to shift that around with messages. And we do that by introducing the unitary UM, which just takes a key and outputs the encrypted message. It works because it's like um, bijective in M. Um, this, therefore, it's unitary. And we can then neatly write down the, the um, meshes state by just conjugating on the classical part with these unitaries. But we can also write like an M-dependent version of that of the orthogonal projection just, just by the same technique, right? So now we get like all these for all M in the in the full alphabet, these orthogonal projections, but they for now don't uh, uh, like give a measurement or somewhere they are not a measurement. Why? Because obviously they don't have orthogonal support, right? So like you, they don't sum to one, they sum to something way, way bigger. Um, so we need to kind of restrict to a subset of messages and then tweak a little bit these orthogonal projections and then create a POVM out of that. So, okay, let's first try to find like a good set of messages. We know that if we average um, all message states, um, we kind of just find a coupling, um, the couple state, why? Because we twirl over all these these unitaries, right? And then we find like the identity here. And if we sum that up, it's essentially the what right, is exactly the decoupled state. Um, and using this, we can kind of see um, how we create uh, the sets of messages. And we do that by just picking a random one, right? So I want to say KN is essentially the size of the sets of messages. I pick like one and n, okay? And then I pick like a random vector. Um, like that, where each of the components is picked independently and uniformly at random. So if I now look at any k from one to this big kn, um, and then at the average value over picking these random vectors of this overlap of like the measure state for some mk with the sum of all the other projections, right? So I sum all the uh, messages, the measurement projections corresponding to the measurement uh, messages ML apart from the MK. Um, if I want to evaluate this, this becomes fairly simple, right? Because the, the random vector um, is picked in that way that like all the components are independent of each other. Uh, so like the sum kind of decouples, it's just this product here, and I have this uniform distribution. Therefore, I can plug in one of the sums, the MK sum in, and use this relation above to just find the decoupled state to the left hand side. And then the, um, this thing here kind of does not even depend on K anymore, right? Because um, you have like an identity sitting on a classic register. Those um, uh, projections are just conjugated, like all the same projections apart from being conjugated with the unitary on the classic register. So this uh, unitary just falls out. This essentially kills the sum and we're in this situation, right? And now this is the thing I call this type two error and discrimination of the decoupled state and the row Zn, uh, En, CQ state. So this is more than Cn, this trace. And then the sum is uh, smaller, obviously, than like the Kn, right? So, okay, to wrap up, we have this average value um, of somewhat 
like trying to it's kind of an it's kind of like a measurement thing but this is not really measurement it's kind of like way bigger than a measurement because there's some many things which might have non-orthogonal support but it's kind of like you you measure exactly that it's not mk right and that error probability like i'm i'm, I'm like in the how to say in a very rough way this is more like in an intuitive way this thing on average is small um if kn is small, right? So it's more than this kn cn, and if kn is smaller than cn, then this is fine. Um, so this is this. I realize I'm a bit short on time, so maybe I need to kind of skip a bit. Um, so, but essentially what you now do is you pick, therefore you can pick a set of messages where the kn is smaller than the inverse of cn, such that this thing is small um, as well, right? So this is just because average is small. Um, and this holds for all epsilon. So like this thing will decay as n to goes to infinity and kind of you just create the, the pu vm by not picking the pi nm themselves, but you look at um, the orthogonal projection of like on the support minus or you cut out kind of the support of the orthogonal complement of all the others. And then this gives you nice pu vm or this gives you pu vm elements because they sum, because they all have orthogonal support, so they sum to something smaller than one, and therefore can be extended to PUVM. And then kind of using very simple, easy tricks, can then see that the guessing probability of L is sending a message M, and if correctly identifying it with the PUVM, um, is lower bounded by one minus something which goes to zeros and goes to infinity. Um, so, okay, this is what we have established. Therefore, also on average, her guessing probability goes to uh, one, as n goes to infinity, right? And I've kind of only talked about um, how I created one of those sets of messages, but Robert, I said it's... you have one minute, yes. okay? Yeah. Yes, I that that will be enough. Thank you. Um, but like to get it for almost all sets of messages, which was kind of the result, you just do it by a standard Markov um, inequality argument. So let me quickly wrap up and connect it to the strong converse or to the private simplification bit. So in the achievability region, the decoupling error goes to zero. And this means by our first proposition that the guessing probability can go to one if and only if Eve has already perfect uh, knowledge of the message. So the sets of messages is one. Therefore, we can uh, securely communicate. Um, but in the strong converse region, where R, R is strictly bigger than the conditional for Norman entropy and the, condition, uh, the decoupling error goes exponentially fast to one as we have established. Um, if can guess the message with certainty, um, even if it is picked out of an exponentially large set, right? So she needs to have fairly little uh, extra side information and then is still able to find out the message. And that's, we kind of say that in that regime, you better not use the keys uh, distilled in that regime because then the communication is totally insecure. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry for slightly running over. No, okay, it's fine. Thank you, Robert. Uh, any question from the audience? Oops. Oh, uh, oh. I have a question. This is yes, Mark. Hey, Robert. Thanks for your talk. Um, I don't know if this would be worthwhile, but if you dig back in the literature, there are these papers of Horace Ewan. His last name is Y U E N. Sorry. Where Sorry. There's there's someone named Horace Ewan. Okay. Um, and he has all these papers where he's um, complaining about security criteria in QKD. And I'm just reminded of it by what you're okay. considering here. And I don't know if it'd be worthwhile for you to take a look at some of those. Oh, yeah. No, I'm no sounds very interesting. Maybe, maybe. Uh... <laughs> His his work was kind of sidelined a bit, and um, yeah, okay, no, thank but, you, thank but, you for, the, the thank way you. that you've thought about this. It, it, it just reminds me of that, and so it might be, yeah, yeah. Worthwhile. I, might, I might just shoot you, I might just shoot you a mail, uh, yeah. such as you can then like to get the to get the spelling right. But yeah, thank you, thank you for like pointing to that. That might be really okay. interesting. Yes, I'll put his name in the Zoom chat. Okay, okay. Yeah, that would help yes. the audience. Yes. Yeah, great. Thank you. I I note it down. Okay. Any other question from the audience? Uh Hao Chung, please go ahead. Yes. Hey, hi, hi Robert. 
Hey, 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 good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, I, I have a paper with Li Gao and my student uh, yes. on one concourse of progress amplification, and we also consider trace distance as the error criteria. But we consider yes. one shot region, so we also have a one shot strong converse exponent yes. bond. Yes. I'm wondering how to compare uh, our results with yours, but we use different parameterization, so I don't see how to compare. Oh, yeah, yeah that, that was kind of like very interesting because we think like basically our both both of our papers were like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, our, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, also, that's really... I use uh, this uh, page version, so. Actually, it's the same as yours. H alpha is a page version, and we don't optimize the second argument, so we are using a yeah. same H. Yeah. Uh, but we use, use different parameterization in front of this R. So yeah, but I think I know. I, I, so like I, I when I remind, uh, I know like the formula wise it looks a bit different, but um, if you if you kind of reparameterize tries the thing, you get essentially the same, right? Apart from yours, like. The exponent is is bigger, so kind of it's a better result because you don't get this two here. Mm -hmm. um, but I think at least like how it is formulated in your paper, it's like not for the worst case, but it's for like the average case. So like yeah, yeah, uh, consider two universal hash. Yes, yes, yes. I and we use um, different, totally different approach. Okay, I think yes, yes. Um, so I I think I think actually like the for trace distance at least. I mean it's kind of one needs to be a bit careful because now there's like even this this tight result for purified distance which is really recent. Um yeah, yes, I, by Johnson and, and Cody, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I was thinking that um for trace distance, kind of like the exponent you have so without the two is actually tight. And um so okay, what we do in order to prove that result is we call this like, I mean, this is also then considered in a, in this in this newer paper by Kelly and Yong Xing Yao. Um, but also again for purified distance, kind of like the strong converse exponent for the smooth max relative entropy, right? Exactly, so, yeah. And um, mm -hmm. we do everything in trace distance and then kind of go to bound to purified distance as well, because that's kind of yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. relation by relation between trace distance and purified distance. But yes. Yeah. And then you get because like for the primary simplification bit, if you if you because then you like in the H min smooth mage H min uh, side of things. Um, it's kind of works a bit better with purified distance because there's like some, um, I mean, it's it, like there isn't, there's this open problem in our papers. Maybe I just refer to it because uh, before of butchering it verbally, but um, there's like a lower bound you can have after hashing um, in purified distance for this a smooth H min, which holds, but it's not clear whether it holds in trace distance because mm -hmm. we, we use then just this thing in purified distance. We kind of did the, the strong converse first in purified distance and then related back with Fuchs van der Graaff to trace distance, and that's why we inherited this 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 two here. I, see. I, see. I think if like this this H or if if this H min smooth H min inequality is also true for smoothing with trace distance, you would then kind of you would you could avoid in our paper purified distance as a whole, and then you also find the exponent without the two, which is kind of the same thing you had. Um, but I, was, I I I personally think using different. Uh, criterion will lead to different error exponent or strong compass exponent. Actually. Okay, uh, I may have to interrupt. So since we are exceeding time, uh, yeah, yes, sorry. You may, uh, no, it's fine. You may take discussion later on in during break. Yes, okay. So now the next speaker is.